so wonderful. This is great to, um, to don't do that. <laughs> to 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 hear your explanation and the way you move through the work that makes it so much more textured and intimate. And hopefully we can continue some of that in this conversation. I was wondering. Much better. Um, so Robert is the founder of the March on Washington Film Festival, which just completed its third season. Um, I'll start out with a question for you both, which is what do you see as the specific roles and spaces in the current movement for social justice? And in what form have you seen art come out of this? I was reminded of some of the things you do carry with, um, some of the memes, for instance. I experienced Black Lives Matter as corporeal. It's in intersections, it's on campuses, and it's on social media. So one of the memes, for instance, uh, satirical that came out was uh, after Cecil the Lion was killed, all lions matter. Was, was a meme that came up. And, you know, so there's a picture of this lion looking into the, uh, mm. uh, into the camera and it says, well, if he had nothing to hide, why is he running? Or um, he was found with tall grass in his system. Or what about lion on lion killings? Um, my, my favorite is how, how is a brother supposed to dress to get some love? And it was a picture of a guy from The Wiz, um, the, the cowardly lion. What do you see? as opportunities for art in places where much of the current movement and social justice um, uh, ideas play out? Where, what do you see as you know, having opportunities for art in social media, um, in those kinds of spaces where young people inhabit? Oh no, I want to yield all of my time to you after, after that amazing presentation. I, I would want to start just by thanking you for your incredible contribution to you know, what we all care about, which is social change and the, and the use of art. So, thank you. All right. Well, the opportunities are boundless. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. I mean, I think, I think that we have really, we've moved into as we were talking about upstairs, like, you know, like an, inc we, an incredible moment. There's a, there's a zeitgeist. This, is, this stuff is breaking open. It's cracking. There isn't a thing that I look at. There isn't a paper that I pick up. There's not an article that I hear. There's not a radio show that I hear where these issues aren't, aren't vital, right? You know, that, you know, that, that, that this, this is a sort of a call to arms in a new way. In a new way, and I think in a, in a fundamental way. So there's this zeitgeist that's going on that I think is really exciting. And so, I mean, for instance, I mean, in the, you know, so I can look at the work that, you know, the, 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 the last work that I just showed you, and it's just like, oh, uh, right, you know, of, you know, of really what's going on out there. I mean, you know, like I'm working with the Ford Foundation this year. The Ford Foundation and its initiative for Arts for Change, you know, has invited, you know, 12 intellectuals, amazing, you know, writers and sculptors and dancers and, um, 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 intellect, public intellectuals to, um, to engage in this sort of dynamic year. Out of that, you know, because I'm insane, my husband says, you know, I'm doing this, 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 this um, another convening of a whole group of artists in, on January 5th at the Ford Foundation where I've invited like, you know, another 100 artists, you know, to join me at the Ford Foundation. These sort of artists that are actually not 100, I'm, I'm exaggerating. Um, um, I, I thought that it might be very, very important. Um, when people saw my project, my billboard project around violence, I received um, uh, tons of email and, um, um, and um, um, Facebook posts. Mm -hmm. People said, can you come to my neighborhood and do this in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? And so I realized that there was sort of this sort of need for a certain kind of training. So I thought, okay. I'm going to invite a group of senior artists, people like the Astro Gates, Rick Lowe, uh, Mark Bradford, etc., cetera, Am Amaya Mesa Baines, the amazing um, um, Lucy, Le Lucy Lepard, uh, Suzanne Lacey, to the Ford Foundation. And each of them has to invite two younger artists, two younger artists that show promise mm -hmm. in this sort of intersection of art and civic dialogue. Mm -hmm. That's not all the work that I do, but that's important to me. And so, and so that is starting to happen, that's happening. Um, 
very, very soon, and I'm very excited about it. It's January, January 5th, and so I think that we're going to have about 100, 100 or so artists uh, and intellectuals in the room, so that there's a lot of stuff that's going on a, like this around the country, right? It, it's sort of bubbling to the surface. Different there pockets. are university programs. You know, when I was teaching, you know, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was talking about art and civic dialogue, knowing that, that you know, if universities didn't have a program in art and civic dialogue, that it was going to be falling behind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now we can sort of look out at a number of universities. There are whole art programs that have been developed to art and civic engagement, right? This is relatively new. This has happened all within the last five years. So, so, so there's some very, very interesting um, shifts that are taking place. And what artists believe they should be involved in as artists. It's not, of course, I love pretty pictures. I love paint. I love color. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I can think of any number of artists who are not, quote, socially engaged artists that I'm, you know, crazy about, and I'm very happy that they make the work that they, that they make. But there is a group of young artists that are coming along, and they're saying that, I, I, I want the work to, 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 to be of service in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And finding new forms. Robert, have you, what have you seen sort well, of what's bubbling I, up? Oh, thank you. Why? I think what's, yes. what's changing before our eyes is the democratization of voice. And you know, it's largely due to the media, but also some liberation of of minorities. We're nowhere near where we need to be in this country, but yes. women are increasingly finding a voice. But the internet allows an almost ecumenical ability to say something, and if people find it interesting, you're on. And there's less and less intermediation by the man, whether mm -hmm. it's media companies or you know any other of the oligopolies that for decades decided whose voice matters. So the, for, just to pick on what you're, to key off what you're saying, the Black Lives Matter movement is interesting to me in many ways, but for two tactical reasons. One, four people uh, putatively founded it, three women and a, and a man. There's no infrastructure. You cannot send a check to Black Lives Matter. You cannot go to an annual dinner. There is no building. And they are making and have made a profound influence. We don't yes. know where it's going to go, but I'm all for it. Um, and um, this is great news, I think, for women and minorities that we have an increasing opportunity to get our voice out there. In That's very exciting. In an unedited way, which is really, really interesting. You talked about the lack of the middleman. I mean, it just comes right at you, and, and people filter through. Um, Carrie, I wanted to ask you, uh, you talked about the Social Studies 101 projects, the public arts campaigns, with the goal to assist in the effort to end violence and activate space. I was very intrigued by that, because people are often predisposed to seeing art in the containers that they want to see them, at the exhibition, in the museum, um, at the place and time of their choosing. Yeah. Um, if they're, um, so, so then if they're provoked, they're provoked in a, in, a, in a place that they can sort of recognize. But what does it mean for the artist to reach an audience in places where they may not have wanted to or have um, been prepared to be engaged? And yes. why is that necessary? What's been the reaction? You know, Because now you're sort of assaulting me in my... You're getting me on my way to work when I just like to listen to music or I'm on my way to yoga yes, class. Yes, yes, sort of, sort of disrupting space. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there, you know, that 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 there, that, that that has to be a part of uh, it as well, the sort of disruption of space, and that's something that I'm, of course, really interested in. That you do disrupt space. <laughs> that you know that there are these sort of uh, ways in which we need to make uh, um, people aware of uh, of the possibility of really what's happening um, around them, even when they. Choose choose not to, not to see it. But one of the wonderful things that happened uh, through Project Activate um, were the, again, the sort of phone calls that I, I got, or the few checks that I got in the, in the mail. I mean, for instance, um, an, uh, an older woman um, called me up one day. Um, she had seen one of the billboards along one of the perimeters. And uh, um, she said, I was driving along, and I, I saw it, and I knew well, I just knew that it wasn't selling me something. <laughs> and so I pulled my car over to the side of the road mm. to just look at it. 
right? And so she took down the number of the advertising agency and she went home, she called the advertising agency and she told them the street that she saw this. I mean, it was really sort of wonderful, the sort of, the sort of you know, and so um, the thing that's been sort of very interesting and very heartening about this that I should tell some of you about, that particularly people that are really interested in this kind of work, because it is difficult, difficult. But the, one of the things that was really kind of wonderful was that I would call an agency and I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really trying to figure out ways of dealing with the violence in, 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 in Syracuse, in our neighborhood. And invariably, the people who worked in these companies would, would then offer their advice on the most strategic ways in order to use their vehicle for what I needed to do. You know, for instance, the, the, the rotating signs guy would say, well, you know, if you, if you put it up on Wednesday, then it actually stays for two weeks, as opposed to if you put it up on Tuesday, where it only stays for a week and a half. Right? Or, or use this form of advertising as opposed to over that form of advertising because that only costs you $39 per thousand as opposed to $69. I mean, you know, so that, so that people were really anxious to figure out their way of assisting me in this problem. They took it on as their project. Right? right, you know, of sort of collaborators with me, unlikely collaborators. It was really quite wonderful. Had there been any pushback for people who were like, I, I hear you, no. but I just don't want to be activated? No, That's ha that has not happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, I don't go on Twitter in those places. So, you know, who knows what's, what else is out there? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll search that for you so you don't you have to. Like me now. Yes, absolutely. She's a colonist, she does <laughs> research. Um, Robert, you began the March on Washington Film Festival in 2013 to mark the 50th anniversary of that milestone event. Um, but what do you think has propelled that festival beyond that anniversary? What's been its impact since it's, it launched? And, you know, since year after year, you're, you're essentially talking about, or the draw is past tense, how do you continue to bring those lessons forward and sustain those conversations? Wow. Um... Well, I'm glad that we're having this conversation at this museum. The museum has hosted several events at the festival, and I think the, the leadership might answer in the same way that I do. Um, our history is mistold. That may be true in many countries. It's particularly acute here. And there's a conscious or an unconscious ability to bleach the facts. And providing an event, a platform, the festival, the Civil Rights Legacy Project and the March on Washington Film Festival, where first-person narrative, documentary and, and people directly involved in the movement era come and talk about how it was, has been overwhelmingly emotional and powerful for audiences. Mm -hmm. The number of men and women of all backgrounds mm -hmm. who want to leap out and say, you know, my aunt wouldn't go to the roller rink in Chambly, Georgia on race mm -hmm. night. You know, it was set aside once a, once a month, race night, that African Americans could go to fill in the blank public accommodation. But my aunt refused to go because it was so undignified to have one, and, and the weeping and the, the hunger the hunger to connect on personal narrative from your own family, from your own community, and the virtual absence of this sort of storytelling in American culture mm. around this era, at least in public, people do it privately. Right. So I, I think that's the hunger that, that people are on to the fact that history is not told well. And in this particular era, there's just so much that we have to uncover. And also that you have a story that's worth telling, that your voice matters, right. that, it, that it counts, you know, and that there is, a, and that there is a, a way. I mean, for instance, if you look across like the literary landscape at the moment, all the top sellers are, 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 are memoirs, 
right? I mean, the idea of telling your story and the importance right. of the right. individual voice, I think, is, is really important. And as you did, you linked it to sort of notions of social media, to Facebook, to all of these sorts of threads that, that are giving us a new, new modes of, um, of uh, opening up those doors that seem to be closed before, and platforms for building them and making them yourself, right? You know, you can like whip out your, your smartphone and, you know, instantaneously have like a whole new persona, you know, of yourself and present it to the world in, you know, like half an hour. I mean, this is like sort of like amazing stuff. But the other thing that I think is sort of really significant about this sort of moment is that I think we are all sort of deeply interested and fascinated with the question of sort of narrative change, right? There's a narrative change. There's a, a shift that's going on. There's another way in which you know when we from 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 Black Lives Matter on, right? And that, that, that this narrative change is not just language, but it's really it, it's really it's real positioning. So that, for instance, you know, um, um, yesterday or Saturday, Friday, you know, in Utica, you know, the students walk out. Students walk out of the school. But they walk out with staff, they walk out with faculty, they walk out with black kids, they walk out with white kids, right? I mean, they're sort of bringing, bringing ideas about class, about gender, you know, that, that race is not the only, only thing that we have to deal sure. with here. You know, what does it mean to like, you know, be human? and to stay, sustain that humanity in the deepest possible way. How does that get dealt with now? And from a historical perspective, at least from the civil rights era, but it's true for every era, with respect to narrative change, how, how does it happen that, uh, that Rosa Parks, um, we, all, we all are taught about and know, Claudette Colvin is a, a woman arrested prior to Rosa Parks who Essentially, without the, the activist training and without being employed by the NAACP, she decides she's not having this on the mm -hmm. bus, and she's arrested. She's 15, she's pregnant, mm -hmm. she's dark-skinned. She is not taken on by the attorneys to represent to go forward. Where is Septima Clark and Ella Baker? One could see a world in which Fannie Lou Hamer is there's a statue and a bridge to Fannie Lou Hamer in every county in this country to spend a few minutes learning about how this woman literally revolutionized first the Mississippi Democratic Party and, and then the nation. But the lack of memorialization and edification and, and even education about it. So we're, I'm deeply interested in what you're talking about. It's not just the antecedent question of narrative change is who decided what the narrative would be. Well, and I mean, if, if you care about social change and you care about the redistribution of power, you have you have to fight the basic premises. Yes, and also, of course, the redistribution of wealth. Well, there's that. <laughs> God bless the Ford Foundation. Your your funding. So <laughs> Dear Ford. Right. You know, I'm only, they only gave me a nickel, relatively speaking. But, but I mean. The, th the thing that's very interesting about all of this, and you've, you sort of really sort of touched on something that really matters to me, and I think that it matters to you as well, in the process of all of this, in the process of, um, you know, there's this really great saying, you know, that the more things change, the more they remain the same, right? You know? And so I was thinking about people like uh, Fannie Lou and... Uh, Ella Baker, mm -hmm. these sort of you know incredible, incredible women, and I, I, I made a piece called "Slow Fade to Black." This idea where all of these sort of extraordinary voices were simply fading, that we simply didn't hear, we didn't hear anything about them, we didn't see anything about them, we didn't read anything about them, nobody talked about them. You know, I mean, this idea you know of being like profoundly invisible, right. even as we are in this sort of incredible moment. Right, of sort of major shift, you know, you know, you know, like I look at, I look at, you know, like I love film, I love film, I love the Cone Brothers, right? You know, I mean, I love these guys. You know, they have never had anything that looks like me and anything that they've done, right? 
You know, or oh, Woody Allen. You know, I'm just, I'm just so angry if I don't know what to do. Right? You know, you know, and, and most of the world. You know, I thought, how is it possible that I can like look at Netflix for the most part all day long and for the most part not see any brown people? Right. I mean, the lack of, the lack of representation is so glaringly profound that it's just shocking. How the fuck do you live a life and not see, see otherness and want that close to you? That's extraordinary to And me. it leaves you with a deep hunger for your story. So when we were talking upstairs. So you have to make them yourself. Right, you have to. This is not the book I wanted to write. It's a book I wanted to read, but it didn't exist. So I had to write yes. it. Yes. This is the art I had to make. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you're talking about too, right? This sort of lack of profound misrepresentation or not rep represented at all or invisibility. And In so you really have to be responsible for your own narrative. So, but then what happens with the, the invisibility, at least um, in, in my experience, in, at some level, you're free to project yourself into the story, which is how I developed a, a, a crush on... Um, Bo and Luke Duke from the Dukes of Hazard, uh, which caused like this dissonance later because the general lead is how they travel with the Confederate flag on the top. So, so later it does show up in, in, in sort of uh, dissonant ways. Um, but at least initially, you know, you project yourself in until you get to the point where you can tell these stories or make this art. Um, Carrie, at your show um, that concluded the Guggenheim retrospective, the, the survey, uh, last year, the Carrie Mae Weems Live, you were, you invited 50 other artists to come in and talk not about your work, but talk about their work. Yes, I do Why that too. Why was that yes. powerful? Yes. And what do you get out of creativity talking to creativity? You know, I just, I just, um, I'm really profoundly nosy. <laughs> I just have to know what other people are doing. I really want to know what other people are doing. I'm deeply interested in that. I always have been. I started my career really, you know, interviewing artists. I mean, I, so I began that way. I'm like, you know, I'm a reporter. You know, I would sort of, you know, I would barge into their homes and, you know, ask them what I thought were probably, you know, really silly questions, but I thought they were very provocative, very small. <laughs> and, but I did start that way. And I thought, you know, you know, being an artist, you know, you have this sort of incredible, not this incredible in some ways, wonderful and a very interesting, dynamic life. And I'm, you know, I'm invited to go to many places. I live in many different sort of stratas and, you know, I thought, well, the Guggenheim is fabulous, but the show already exists, you know, and it had existed for like several years. It had been traveling around for several years already. And I thought, you know, it's coming to New York. I really need to do something that really crystallizes in a profound way what this moment really means. Mm -hmm. because, because in 2014, I was the first African American ever to be given a solo exhibition, to be given a retrospective at the Guggenheim. And this is shocking. Year, right? This is shocking. I thought, no, 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 no. Obviously, some, I'm not a great artist. Somebody came before me, right? So, so I thought, well, then, then I really need to use this moment, you know, uh, to really think about. And again, this is sort of very important for people that are involved in sort of like the stratas of education to really use this moment to really think about what the Guggenheim had ultimately missed. Right. But they had missed right. by not paying attention to these extraordinary right. artists who were working across many, 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 many platforms. And so actually it was uh, um, 100 and um, um, about 20 artists who were invited over the course of uh, four days. Um, the Astro Gates, uh, we brought uh, Barr. That was a whole group of artists, young artists from Chicago. Um, uh, Craig Harris, again, who was here, uh, played. Jason Moran played. Um, uh, Jerry Allen played. So we had concerts. It was sort of this, it was a, this really an amazing, an amazing mm -hmm. moment. And it's become, I think, in a very important way, um, a kind of hallmark for a number of institutions who are saying, oh, this forward. is what it means when artists right. are involved, when artists are in the house, and this is what artists create. We create things that are very different 
than academics, and we create things that are very different than uh, administrators. We really do work very differently, and our relationship, because we cut through all the, the, the nonsense. You know, administrators are administrators, and artists are artists, and so we come together um, knowing that we're sharing a platform of engagement. And so it's been really critical, and, uh, and I continue to do it. What, what they missed and what they didn't even know that they didn't know about And, and they the didn't know that they didn't know. Um, <clears throat> Robert, you've characterized Washington as a place where there are people who work on stuff that's always moving, appropriations bills, where, where you know, there are always things that have to get done. And there are other people who are trying to change the climate um, to get something to move or to stop moving. Is there a way the March on Washington Film Festival fits directly into either of those categories, or does it, is it more finely attenuated um, in one of those roles more specifically? Um, you know, is it, is it more counting the votes or manning the barricades when, when you put on this type yes. of festival? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's both. So it's going to be, it's the, the festival and the Civil Rights Legacy Project is open source. People should be coming to us with their stories and their content and their artistry um, and we will find a way to curate it, display it, and get it out to the American public. So it's going to go in the direction that the American public wants it to go. Um, you know, art, art plays a, a crucial uh, role in policy change. So in order to have policy change, you have to have social change, except for fascist countries, or at least I'll just stick to this country. Policy follows the culture. Uh, it's very, very rare that elected officials get ahead of constituents, and, and many would argue that's <laughs> the way it should be in a representative democracy. Um, and art plays an enormous role in forming public opinion, and, and it can be the literal. Uh, I think of the women in um, southeastern Alabama who sold quilts when... Oh, the G's when been. G's so outside of G's Bend, yes. So yes. the women of G's Bend have have had fantastic um, artistic manifestation of their quilts. It was a cooperative some miles away, the Freedom Quilting Bee. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was put together to literally raise money for men and women who were out of work because of their participation in the boy in the Montgomery Selma uh, mm -hmm. boycotts. So that's a very literal where our, and Harriet Tubman and, and Frederick Douglass sold their speech, sold their words in order to do anti-abolition work. So where art gets commodified in order to support, and you see that with all kinds of artists. And then, and, and it's fairly lousy in Washington, and I call on you to help us, but the use of imagery and artistry to move public opinion. And, and, and it's everywhere. I think that when you live and work here, you don't see it because it's everywhere, but the, the pink ribbon and the use of pink to draw attention to breast cancer. Some, one of the most you know, powerful examples I've ever thought of in this area was the AIDS quilt. And the power of that quilt was particularly, I have to harken back to 25, uh -huh. 27 years, but Reagan and, and the ilk wouldn't talk about AIDS. And activists couldn't get him to say anything. Mm -hmm. And bringing quilts, which was a representation, it got beyond the numbers. It was actual men and women with lives. And bringing that to the mall mm -hmm. forced some in a political establishment to deal with this quite differently. So we could, we could go on and on. But the use of poetry and visual arts and performance arts um, around public policy is crucial. I'll end where I started. I'm on the left. We don't do it as well as we should. And there has to be a much better infrastructure to connect <coughs> how public policy is formed with artistry and artists uh, in all of their manifestations. It really makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, with that, um, we have a, a, a wonderful Sunday supper waiting yes, for us. Do. So um, I'd like to just thank you for this conversation. Oh, we we you could go very on. Much. So. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I so appreciate it.